All right, we are here. We are here with my wonderful friend, Dr. Shannon Reed, who is an equine surgeon at The Ohio State University. Um, she's doing this not in any affiliation with that school, however. So she is here as a facilitator from VLE. Um, and so she is the one who introduced me to this podcast, Finding Fred. And so we will get there, I promise. But I wanted, I thought it would be fun for me to ask Shannon a couple questions about how she got involved with the VLI and those kinds of things. So Shannon, would you tell us about when you came to VLE and what your first impressions of our program were? Oh, and yeah. before we start, I just want everybody to know, I did not give Shannon any of these questions ahead of time. <laughs> So this is all 100% spontaneous. You should also know that I have no neutral face. So you'll see exactly what I think of Betsy. <laughs> yes. If we were in surgery, I could practice neutral eyebrows. Like, okay, yeah, uh -huh. but we're not. Is, um, that a thing? is that a thing? Neutral yeah, no, eyebrows? you got to learn to keep neutral eyebrows because often the client is watching you through the windows. So you got to be like from here up, like no big deal while the bottom is like, ah! yeah. Okay, neutral yeah. eyebrows. All right, yeah, neutral tonight. eyebrows, which I'm not great at without my mask. I need my surgery mask. You should have told me I needed my surgery mask to answer these questions. Okay. Uh, so, my bad. I think I first came in 2009 or 2010, but it might have been 2009. Um, and I, because I hadn't been at Missouri that long, I had just come back there to start on its faculty after finishing my residency. And Ron Cott was a part of VLE and VLI. Well, it wasn't VLI then, it was just VLE. And he said, I think you should go. So he used his money from Missouri that they gave him every year to send faculty and sent to me. Um, and I remember I was in a group. Um, yeah, I, it, then, then it was students and faculty sort of together. Um, and I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, <laughs> at all. I'm still not sure what I got into, <laughs> honestly. Um, yeah, and I, my general impression at first was just, this is a lot. I don't know how to put it other than, yeah, this is a lot. What did, what did that, um, can you, can you dig into that a little bit now that yeah. you, like, with, in, with hindsight? Like, yeah, what, I mean, I think that, on? At the time that I had come, I had been running as fast as I could professionally for as long as I could. And there had not been an opportunity or a time to push me to reflect at all. Like I'd gone from high school to college, trying to get into vet school, into vet school, into getting an internship, going to a residency, doing a fellowship, passing boards, becoming a new faculty and through that time you run and you run and you run and you run and you put your best professional face forward but i don't think you really ever have the time to reflect on why you're doing what you're doing or who you are or 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 what you're doing yeah. so it was just a moment of like it was probably the quietest i had been for an extended period of time in years yeah yeah, and I think that's a lot of people's experience, right? As they get there and they're like, what? Because everybody's like, what? What, it, what is VLE? And what is it, you know, what happens when you're there? And it's so hard to explain, but then you get there. And I think a lot of us are doing that exactly what you've described. We're going from one thing to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, because that's what you do when you're trying to be a medical professional. Um, and you don't take time to slow down and then you get there. And if you've been running, 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 and all of a sudden you're in the nature and woods and it's quiet and you're having to reflect that can I think that's appropriate it's an appropriate response right to say that's too much it was just a lot yeah I wouldn't say too much it was just oh yeah you didn't say you didn't yeah, say that. You it's, said it's a lot, lot. it yeah. was just like this is not the world I live in yeah and so you do you, you came as a participant once I came as a participant once and then I came back the next year as a facilitator in training and so what, what caused you to come back? I don't know. <laughs> I, that's the honest answer is yeah, I really, yeah. I don't, I think I felt like I hadn't finished. Okay. When I went there and, 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 and also not just that I hadn't finished, but that, um, there was some part of me that wanted to do something different yeah. and that I spent all of my days 
as an equine surgeon and we have our type and we have our responsibilities and we have our things that we do. And I saw it as an opportunity for me to make my own way and do something that was outside the norm for me and just be who, whoever I wanted to be for that period of time while I was there. So it was just a way to do something different than what I had been doing. Okay. Um, I remember, like, I'm trying to remember, I remember you and I having a conversation and I can't remember if it was when you were a participant or when you had come back as a facilitator that first year you came back as a facilitator, but I remember you saying something to the effect of, I'm not sure if I buy this. I'm not <laughs> sure if I, I'm not sure if I get, I'm not sure if I'm buying everything you're selling, Betsy. Can yeah. You tell me a little bit about that. Um, well, I'm still not sure if I'm buying everything yeah. I'm selling. <laughs> okay, that's fair. No, I mean, just because that's me. Well, and I think where I remember that coming from a little bit is that, um, again, in the professional world that I live in and was raised in, there's just a certain way that things go. And to talk about group dynamics and servant leadership and all of those things, I could see, and I can see more now, but it was hard for me to see that working in the middle of all of the high pressure situations that come up sometimes in my day. So that was part of it. Like, okay. yeah. this is all great until we're in colic surgery. Yep. And then I don't have time to work through what we're going to do as a team to get the colon out and make Absolutely. decisions. But I think that was oversimplifying what was going on. Okay. And part of the reason I asked that question um, is because I, I am watching what's happening in our world right now. And I'm always looking through the lens. And, and really, since my first time as a VLA participant, and then all the years that I've been involved with this organization and what we're trying to accomplish within the profession, I'm always paying attention to things from a leadership standpoint. Like who, and what I mean by that is who is who in the scenarios, whether that's in a practice, whether that's in my house, whether that's in the, like right now I'm watching who is leading, who are the leaders? And by the leaders, who are the people who are actually influencing people's behavior towards something different? Yeah. Um, and so uh, part of why I started where I started in the questioning is I think what I've seen in you over all the years that we have been friends is I've seen you becoming a person. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I've seen you becoming a person of influence in equine veterinary medicine. And I'm and what I'm watching is, okay, so how is she doing that? And it it is a lot of the things that we talk about at VLI, right? Like it is the taking time to be reflective, taking time to think about how am I, I mean, some of the conversations that you and I have, right? Like you'll send me a text and you'll say, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. I am missing with the person that I'm trying to accomplish that with. What do I need to think about? Um, and so I think that it, it's, it's interesting to think about where you started and where you are now. And, and it's not to say that you've you're again, I, I'm not sure I'm buying everything I'm selling, but there are things there are things that we have for sale at VLI that are very effective. Yeah. Um, and I think those things right now where we're at are very, very important. Um, so thank you for, for answering those questions. Um, and, and then I want, so then like, I, I just love, there's certain people in my life that I just love thinking about, about where we've been, where we've come, what were the, what were the turning points that caused us to get to a different level of friendship or, um, and so I, I'm going to go back now. I can't remember. I tried to look on my text messages. Let me see if I pull. It was, it was in November-ish. when you. So it was November 3rd. You sent me a text that said, current podcast, Dolly Parton's America. And I was like, that's the most random thing <laughs> that I can think of getting from Shannon. Shannon, Because I didn't, I didn't peg you as a Dolly Parton fan. Um, and so I was like, okay. And I, and then I tried to, I thought we had a text. I thought we had a conversation back and forth. Cause I was like, uh, tell me more. Like, should yeah. I really spend my time? And I couldn't find that thread. Yeah. Cause I'm just like, tell me more what's going on with this. 
And I think I can't, again, I can't find that, but I found there's a, um, here, I'm going to start sharing my screen, I think. Um, let's see. See, I can't see. I got to take off the cool glasses <laughs> so I can see and read. Um, oh, dang it. Where is it? I'm not going to spend much time looking for this. Um, anyway, I can't find it, but it, we had this conversation. I sent you a text like, okay, I'm on episode four and I'm sobbing and I'm thinking like, to me, Dolly Parton was an unbelievable, is an unbelievable person of influence. And so she is able to bring people together from all different um, walks of life. People who believe differently, people who are ethnically different, people whose sexual orientation is different. She's a bit able to bring people together in an amazing way. And so I love that. Um, Cause I'm, I'm just, so what does she do? So tell me about what, what it was that you loved about that podcast. Um, the Dolly Parton one. I, I think it was just because listening to it, it was mostly about navigating the world in a way in which you, I guess what I love about listening to the things about Dolly Parton and the people that talked about her is it was just a way to navigate the world and, and how many different things are coming at us at a time and how many different people are in our lives and it to not become insulated to only what we agree with or only what we want to hear. Or I think the biggest thing that struck me in that podcast wasn't that it was this episode when they were talking about politics and they said something like that Dolly Parton didn't exclude anyone, that there was just room in her life, even for people that she didn't agree with. And for me, and it was not just that, it was just the whole theme of listening to everything that was in there was something that I have found like to be my word, if you will, for the last year and a half. And that's this concept or the word grace. Mm -hmm. And I felt like when I listened to Dolly Parton's, the podcast and everything like that, I just heard how one person exuded grace throughout their life. And yeah. that's, that's my word that I have latched on to for myself and for the people around me. And I can't say that I live it from every moment because it's really hard, but I think that's what appealed to me about that podcast is I just felt that she was embodying what grace meant to me. Yeah. And I think you and I have a shared um, passion for another person in our life that did that. Like, I, th I think, I think that's part of why Drake was so amazing. Yeah. Is because he had this ability to find just to, he didn't care about any, anything you know regarding what you thought or what you he just wanted to be he just wanted to know you and yeah. he was so he was so good at getting like I think he was so good at just giving all kinds of people grace and he, he taught me that especially in the last two years of his life because I what I wasn't and I continue to struggle with how do I how do I do that well how do I um, and so that that is part of what I loved about I think Dolly Dolly's America, Dolly Parton's America helped me see somebody doing that on a, on a big level. Like I think Drake did it on a, you know, in my community, but it, or in our, in our little sphere of influence. Um, and Dolly was a, watching somebody do that on a huge scale um, in a way that I think our country desperately needs. Um, so I, and again, I asked that, I just wanted to know a little bit about Dolly because, so you sent me that you didn't steer me wrong on that. Like I've listened to it the whole thing probably three times. And it was the first podcast that I listened to where it hasn't, hadn't all been released yet. Yeah. So it was just like, how long do I have to wait for the next episode? This is just awful. Yeah. Uh, I just want, I just wanted to binge listen to it, but it was good because it caused me, it forced me to slow down and think about um, the uh, everything that was in there. So then fast forward to last week, you've only emailed me or you've only texted me about two podcasts, <laughs> Dolly Parton's America, and then Finding Fred. And I didn't look back to see what the text said about that, but I think it was something like another podcast, Finding Fred. <laughs> and I listened to the whole thing in probably a day and a half because it was all way done. Yeah. So tell me, tell me about why Finding Fred. Well, I mean, 
I guess one is ever since the first documentary came out about Fred Rogers, so it was the actual documentary, not the movie with Tom Hanks. Okay. And I, yeah, went I, haven't, watched I haven't watched that yet. Yeah. I mean, I, I movie with Tom Hanks, but I yeah. haven't watched the documentary. I definitely used to watch Mr. Rogers as a child. Like I do remember that. And I, I don't, I guess consciously I didn't connect that time in my life to anything specifically. I just know I watched Mr. Rogers. Okay. And then I saw the documentary. And when I saw the documentary about him, I just kind of was blown away by who he was as a person. Um, <clears throat> and, and so I was sort of drawn to it already. Um, the idea of Fred Rogers from watching that documentary. And I think specifically the ways in which he dealt with things in that show were just crazy to me that someone could be so forthcoming and honest and direct and do things in subtle ways that had a big impact like the scene of him sitting in the pool with officer oh shoot i forget his last name like yeah. but that was like that was so powerful so i think that's why i first started to want to listen to the podcast but then i listened to it and kind of was like god this is it again this is grace and a different individual and yeah. that i think the second I don't, you know, I don't want to keep going back to that word, but it's just that idea of, of living in this, in this sort of peaceful existence. But, you know, by the time I finished the pod, podcast, the, the reason why I really liked it is they talked about some of the struggles that Mr. Rogers himself had. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was also interesting to see this person that everyone recently has been holding up as the perfect yeah. individual. And then yeah. they talked about the struggles that he had. Yeah, I loved, um, I am going to go back and watch the documentary. I'm still just processing the podcast and I'm processing the movie a little bit. But I remember in the movie, there was a scene where his, um, the guy, the reporter um, or journalist was waiting for him and Fred Rogers' wife was there. It's a scene between the journalist and his wife. Yeah. She was just like, he's not perfect. Like you need, and, and that, I loved that mostly because I've, I was married to Drake for so many years and everybody's like, oh, he's just, and he was incredible. There's no question, but he also had his own struggles and his own, um, but he was super in touch with those. And yeah. I think that's what allowed him. I mean, and I keep bringing Drake up just because I, I knew him and I lived with him and I watched what well, you know, and I'm, and I am trying to become more Drake like in my approach to to things. And so I'm constantly thinking about why, what is it that allowed him to connect with people? What is it allowed that allowed Fred Rogers to connect with people? And I think it was this deep understanding of his own brokenness. Because then it's way to me, if I understand the parts of me that aren't whole, it's way easier for me to understand the parts of you that are whole and, and love them anyway. Does that make sense? Or am I no, it, it does. It does make sense. And I think that's why I really enjoyed the podcast was it was just, and I think there was parts in it that some people would disagree with the guests speaking about maybe their politics or whatever. And I don't really expect everyone to have agreed with every component of it, yeah. but the ideas and the things that were running through it could apply no matter who you are. And I, you know, you and I have had a lot of talks about religion and things like that. And I don't live a life where I'm at church every week or anything like that. But I enjoy discussing the spiritual because I think it's part of our world. And I think it was just kind of also a really interesting part of it. But, you know, back to what you said is that um, <clears throat> I think there was two things. It was that he was coming at it from a place of knowing and perfection. And then there was that very being present in the moment. And for yeah. me, being present in the moment is really hard mm. because if I had, I'm sure if I had been born 20 years later, I would have been put on every other medication known to man as a child to make me sit still. Yeah. So the idea of being present and slow and methodical is just really challenging and interesting to me. Yeah. Do you, do you, have you thought about why that is for you? Why it's hard to be in the present? I just can't stop my brain. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. And I, I think that I've gotten much better, probably, and again, this is probably some starting to go to VLE, to embracing yoga and meditation yep. Yep. And, and things like that, that have added a little bit to that, to my life, but I can't ever be completely still. And I have yet to be able to be completely still and achieve that. But that also makes me good at the other part of my job of multitasking and keeping everything up in the air sure. and things like that. 
that. Sure. So I don't know what the inherent mechanism that makes it so hard for me. Like you and I can have a conversation now and I can be present with you in a much different way than I could have 10 years ago. Totally. Uh, but I'm, I never quite nail it. Uh, tell me more about what you mean by that. You never quite nail it. Well, like <laughs> there's always something like, I'm like, well, I'm on call. My phone's quite over here and I'm trying to pay attention uh, to her. And then there's this window. I don't know. Like, yeah, but okay. maybe for okay. me, that's as much as I can give. I don't know. Yeah. And I, and part of the reason I asked that question is because I always feel like you're, especially in the last two years, I always feel like you're present with me. Yeah. So it, it would, so that caught that, that statement caught me a little off guard. Like I'm not, I don't quite get it. I'm like, well, wait, no, you're totally, you're a million. <laughs> well, I, I should say you're a million per percent better than you were five years ago. You know, like you, and, and so that brings me to, well, it's a skill, right? Being quiet and being still, especially if you're wired to be moving, it's a skill to be quiet. Yeah. And you have, you have been, you've done some things in your life to practice that skill, yoga, meditation, in, uh, being willing to answer my questions and, and go places with me that, um, I don't yeah. know if you would, you, you're like, that's a, how does that serve me right now? Like, what are we talking about? Why are we talking about this? This is ridiculous. I need, I got stuff to do. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Which, which you don't do like now you're just like, Hey, yeah, I'd really like to talk about that. And it's not always me initiating those things anymore. No. Now it's you initiating like Betsy, I'd really like to talk to, about this. And that, and then I'm just like, sweet, that's all. Let's do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I was just listening to, I re-listened to a couple of them before getting on this call with you. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, especially what's going on in the last few weeks here, I was listening to the one that it said, help the helpers. And I, I read that title and I wanted it to be like that, that you always read that phrase that said, you know, Mr. Rogers said in times of hardness, you should look around and you always find the helpers. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me in that particular episode <clears throat> that they're talking about like, Hey, Mr. Rogers was talking to children. <laughs> and now that you're an adult, the point of all this is, it's time for you to be Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Be the helper. And I was like, oh, son of a... So there's something comforting. <laughs> I'll just look for the helpers. And yeah. it was like, no, that's not what he was saying. <laughs> yeah. He's saying, um, actually, maybe you should look in the mirror and then yeah. that's where you'll find the helper. And yeah. I think that's what was intriguing to me about um, having our VLI community engage in the podcast, right? Because I think yeah. that's what we're trying, what, that's what we're asking people to do is we're asking them to be people of influence, which ultimately is the helpers, you know, like we're asking them to step into a leadership paradigm that maybe is, is atypical for our society because it's a little bit more thoughtful. It's a little bit more slow. It's a little bit more intentional. And I think that those are the things that are actually working right now in this crisis. It's not the, um, it's not the, uh, the word blustery is, is, you know, it's not the people that are up there and they're going and it, it's the, it's Dr. Fauci is what it is, right? It's the, yeah. and I just read an article about him this morning because he's been absent from the, um, press conferences for the last two days and everybody's freaking out about that because he has been kind of a um he's been a rock in what seems like this chaotic storm and he's just been solid and i read this article about him and it it was fascinating why like all he's a fred rogers and he's spent his whole career living the way that like being intentional and slow and quiet and and you know the things that the things that come up about him all the time in that article anyway and again it's just one article but i've been watching him for the last two weeks and it's just like dramatic the the uh, the ability he has to have influence um but he's like that what they say in the article is it's a bipartisan like he is able to unite um people across all kinds of different um, opinions. And that's, I think, what we need. And it sound, it, to me, that's what Dolly Parton does. That's what Fred Rogers does. 
I think my own husband did that well. I think Dr. Fauci's doing that. And so again, I'm just thinking about what is it that our leadership can, you know, if we're trying to change veterinary medicine um, and for the positive, what are the, what are the things that we need to be instilling in people? Yeah, and I, I think the other thing that struck me about both Dolly Parton and Fred Rogers in their group is just the inherent kindness. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the biggest thing. And, and I think, so also not just kindness. Yeah, I know, that was it. It was just this inherent underlying theme of, of kindness through all of it. Yeah. And we're not really doing that very well in our country right now. Being kind to each other. Although I would say that it's starting, I think, I think we're all starting to recognize that this is a way bigger deal than what we first thought. And so now I think we're, we're, I'm starting to see little pockets of kindness instead of the fear and the self-protection and the, I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna take care of my own and I'm gonna hunker down. Um, I think it's starting to change. What do you think? No, I definitely think it is. And I, you know, um, I have that dumb next door app on my phone. that's like all about your neighborhood and what's going on. But now I'm like in a smaller neighborhood. And for the last, the first week, it was like, people are mad about things being closed or whatever. In this last few days, it's just been people posting, hey, I've got a car. You want me to stop by, put a list on your door. I'll go get it for you. Yeah. Or yeah. Things like that. And I feel like even the tone of the next door has changed to, yeah. I, you know what, this is what it is. How can I help you? Yeah. And I think that that's a big difference. And even we're going through it at work. It's, you know, only so many people can be in the building and how do we take care of everybody's needs? And, you know, if this person has kids and they need to be home watching them, can yeah. I be here? And then they can do this. And so it's a way in which people haven't worked together in a long time. Totally. And I think that's, um, it's, it's cool to me to just seeing all these things that we talk about at VLI all the time, actually having to be put into practice. I don't think we've had to put them into practice and now we have to. And like I read, I just read a post um, by one of the, um, a VLE alum who was talking about how at his veterinary hospital, they have, they have divided into two teams and those two teams never work together at the same time. There's one team that's on and then the next team that's on. So then it, so that if somebody gets sick, they still have a, a team that can work, right? So they're not, and, and just thinking about things like that, like how do we solve this? How do we solve the problems that we're facing that we've never had to face before? Um, and so it is, I do like that we're now um, coming together. I had a, um, I wanna read this, um, I had somebody post or ask me a question. Let's see if I can find it. I wanna read it to you and see what you think um, or how you would answer this question. Um, because I do think that one of the things that um, both Dolly and Fred were really good at is being present, right? Like you, and you said you're, you know, you kind of struggle with that. And I think that being present is, um, important. So one of my friends, so we were talking just about uh, this idea that I had posted this thing on my, an article that I thought, this essay that I thought was just awesome. And it was this guy who compared, you know, we, we all want to have a map of what's going to happen. And, and his argument was history doesn't repeat itself, but man repeats itself. And so he was comparing the situation in World War II to the situation that we're facing now from the standpoint of what do we as a society need to do we need to come together and he gave all these examples and so um my friend Devin asked me this question he said do you think the response results will be different when instead of coming together the current situation is forcing us apart at least physically now that's not the that that's not the question I want you to answer um because I was like I that's an interesting question right because we're in during World War II everybody could be together solving the problems we can't physically be together so then he made a um he made a com uh a comment about 
the concept of coming together while staying apart using technology that has been, over the last few years anyway, blamed for causing a breakdown of social connectivity, which is now our only way of staying connected. So what do you think about this? What do you think about this dichotomy of we need to come together, but we're physically apart? How, do you, how are you managing that in your own work life, home life? Does my question make sense? Yeah, no, I think it does. And it's funny because it's sort of been changing for me as I think about it, because I think we have to do two things going forward. I think we have to learn to connect with people online and through ways in a way that engages and moves forward instead of just stupid bickering about nonsense, yeah. bull crap, I'll say yeah. for our, <laughs> yeah. you know, so that part of it, is going to happen, I think, because I think people are going to start to, you know, change up their friends group and say, you know what, I don't know why I have a thousand friends when I don't agree with 600 of them. So, but also that makes you a bit insular. So I don't want that to completely happen, but you can have people that you don't have the same views with, but you still mesh with their core values. And yeah. so I think that it could make social media that much more real for us. If you have to spend two weeks listening to these people, you might just decide what's actually important and who you yeah. really want to talk to. Yeah. The second thing about this that I think is maybe different from your point, but real to me is that I think it's time that people spent some time with themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that this time for the next couple of weeks forces people and me to just spend some time with me. <laughs> yeah. Why you do know? you think that's important? Because I think that you lose, you spend so much time to connect <clears throat> socially online and then offline to do your job and things like that, that we don't spend enough time just being. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to force us to spend some time being. Yeah. And I, it's, it, that's a, an interesting point because I have kind of taken this last year after Drake passed away to just really, I, I've kind of been retired kind of, you know, like I've had a lot of time. Um, sometimes too much time because then I can get too much in my head. And, and so I, I do have, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I have people like you in my life that are like, Hey, Betsy, maybe you need to, you know, do something besides just sit and write for four hours every day. Um, but it's this, I have this forced um, aloneness that I've never had, that I've never really had to encounter. And so I feel like a little bit like everybody's getting, you know, forced into these, this quiet that I've been living for the last year. And I'm just like, you guys, it's so good. You know, like, and, and so I'm all ready to um, encourage people to be writing and thinking and, and the, um, the thing that we're going to do um, this afternoon. I mean, this, this um, interview will be posted after we've done this exercise, but I'm going to, I'm going to invite people to draw you know, like do some of the things, kind of what you were talking about before we started recording, like do something you've never done before. And I love that um, in the first, so I just invited everybody to listen to the first episode, although I'm hoping people will listen to all of them, but so I'm just picking things out of the first episode. And so I love when he, when Mr. Rogers is like, sometimes when I have a bad dream, I draw a picture about it. Um, and then that makes it, you know, better you know it helps me to understand what are my feelings and what was going on and then I can go back to sleep and I just think that there's a lot of people that are home and terrified and they don't know how they don't know how to talk about their feelings they don't know how to do exactly what you're talking about be alone with themselves in the quiet it's a hard skill when we when the badge of badge of honor that all of us have been wearing for the last five years is I'm so busy I can't even I only get three hours of sleep a night aren't I amazing <laughs> yeah it's, no you're stupid <laughs> that's what you're you know like yeah and I think another this is maybe not at all where you're going but I kind of like it is that especially in veterinary medicine since this is the group we're going to be talking to we all have this little bit of hero complex like no one wants to talk about it but like I've watched people these last few weeks when I've been like, hey, you're sick, you should go home. And they've somehow like been like, I have to fight on. Yeah. And it's, but you're not, you're making it worse for other people. Yeah. So I'm just, I, I do see, think that veterinarians are going to step to the forefront and have a big part in this and things like that. But I also think that they're going to be forced to realize that when it really comes down to essential 
like where do you lie in that part of it and what part of your life is really essential like when you talk about your day-to-day your work life and you consider yourself essential which we are which parts of us are essential because it's not nail trims yeah that's a that's a great question i'm gonna have to listen to the recording of that again just so i can get it exactly right but which part we are essential but which parts are essential the way that drake and i describe that when we began the walk into the valley of the shadow of death is we said foolishness and nonsense fall away really fast right like when you're facing life and death the things that matter rise to the top and everything else like i'm not i'm not even going to spend time on that and so i think that's what you're saying right like what are the essentials of what we do and who we are because those are the things that matter and so why aren't we spending time on those yeah. And I, I think if, if people spend the next week just still staying on social media and the news and getting anxious and crazy, then they're just going to drive themselves further into some sort of abyss. But if they rein it in for a minute and think it through and find their neighbor and figure out how they can connect with themselves and work yeah. through this, then I think a lot of people will just be quieted by this period of time. Mm-hmm. It's the, to me, it's the silver lining of this whole thing. Like even just going out in the neighborhood and seeing people out in, in their yards. Like I, I've never, I've lived in the neighborhood that I'm in since 2013, I think. So a long time. And I've never seen the number of people in just, and it's a week, you know, and I'm, everybody's like, well, nobody's going to work, Betsy. That's why they, and I'm like, well, no, this is a Saturday. And so on a Saturday, I've, ne- I've never seen the number of people out walking together. And then I'm just thinking, oh, they're walking their dog. Nope, they don't have a dog. There's no dog in the vicinity. They're just out walking together as a family. That's amazing. Why aren't we doing those things? I, I just think it's, so I think that that's part of the silver lining in this whole thing is learning how to be, to slow the pace down, right? Like, it's one of the things, this, it's one of the things I know Drake would just be super excited about because he, he lived, he lived like this anyway. Um, but I think he would just be like, look, Betsy, look at all these people that are getting back, getting back to what matters. We've gotten away from what matters. So. Yeah, I went, I went for a run yesterday in the same neighborhood I run in every morning and I never see anybody. Well, cause it's dark. It's before work, but yeah. still. And there were people out and people were like waving at me like they meant it. Not like the yeah. Missouri finger wave, which is like this thing, but like, yeah. the, ah, yeah. and I'm like I, yeah. I don't know, but hello, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I saw, so there's this house I go past on, my, on, on the way to getting to the hike that I do all the time. And they've been doing all this amazing landscaping, but it, you know, they're kind of just picking away at it. It's probably been over the last month and a half. And one day there'll be a plant, you know, a new plant, a couple, uh, last week there was this really cool fountain thing that they'd put in. And I'm just always like, gosh, this is so great. I love walking past this house. Well, the guy that lives there and he and his son were walking in. And so, I mean, and he's, he's, more than six feet away from me but I said hey is this your house and he was like yeah and I said it's you what you guys are doing out here is amazing I walk by here every day and it is just you guys are doing a really good job like I've never I would never and I'm an extrovert so I would normally I mean I do talk to people but I I don't know what it is I I don't know any of my neighbors I've lived here seven years I don't know any of my neighbors and now all of a sudden in the last week, I'm, I know more neighbors than I, or I've talked to more neighbors than I've talked to in the last seven years. <laughs> yeah, no, my neighbor on either side has texted us to be like, I'm going to the store. Do you want anything? I, I don't know them. I do now. <laughs> yeah. How did they get your number? Well, like we did when we first moved here, because we have the horses, we yeah. put out like a little flyer in everyone's mailbox being like, because we have the only horses in the neighborhood. And it's okay. like, if they're doing anything weird or whatever, here's our number just in case. So that was a little bit it. And then I don't know after that. (laughs) So now we're splitting mulch with them next week. We have a load of mulch coming. (laughs) Oh, great. I love that. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to do this and taking the time. I love hearing your thoughts on things. If you could, so I called this in the little schedule that I put out, I called it, um, why, I, I, I spoke for you. I didn't ask. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> um, why Mr. Rogers is my hero. What, how would you answer that question just in closing? 
Uh, I made the well, assumption that he is your hero. He is no, no. He is a, I, I could call him a hero. I could say he's a hero for sure. Okay. Because he embodies the things that I aspire to be someday. And that is peaceful and calm and full of grace. Awesome. I love that. Well, I think that you are becoming that person. And it's awesome to see. So. And I did not swear once in this you whole didn't. thing. <laughs> it was close. I, I think you said the C R A P word, but I did. Yeah, but come on. Even Mr. Rogers would say that. <laughs> he probably would have. Oh, he probably would have. Okay. If awesome. you were still alive good. today, he would definitely say. It. Now, my question for you is: Are you going to try and watch any of the Mr. Rogers shows now? I actually, I think everybody should be doing that. So it is on my list of things to do today. Like, how do well, where, where yeah. are they? How do I watch them? Because I don't, I don't remember. I don't have a memory of watching Mr. Rogers when I was a kid, but then when I was watching the movie, I had all these weird trig, you know, like it was like, wait a minute, I think I saw that episode. And so I have all these kind of foggy memories um, about, I, I remember Sesame Street and I remember Electric Company. Um, and so I, I think that was all the same time. So No, it was It was all on PBS. In fact, it was Mr. Rogers that saved PBS when Congress was going to pull it from oh, them. Oh, that's right. And but so it would have been all like, you know, when we were younger and I grew up a little bit poor, I, I don't know where he, we didn't, there was no cable. Yeah, we, at that were definitely, we were definitely lower middle, you know, middle class-ish, <laughs> maybe a little bit lower. And like, we yeah, we had, we had food. Yeah, it was sometimes not the, it was a lot of casseroles, but the point is, I <laughs> had a lot of hamburger helper. <laughs> I had PBS, so I think yeah. that that's, it's probably going to be in your site. So I'm going to see if it's on the PBS and see if there's, there's 30,000 shows we can watch for the next couple of weeks. Oh, awesome. But yeah, I was, I, I'm like, I want to, I want to watch some of those because they're so profound. And so, and that was part of the pod, you know, listening to the people remember Mr. Rogers and, and it, the impact it had on them as a kid. And so I wonder if it, if part of who I am um, was shaped by that. And I don't even realize it was shaped by that, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I, I don't know what's going to be funny after watching them is whether or not it was him that was profound or whether it was people's reactions to him that were profound. Ah, uh, interesting. Interesting. And, and I, I do think that it will be, um, there's a pace. I, one of the things that they talked about in the, I think in the podcast a lot was the pace with which he moved through the world. Yes. It's very much slower than everything else. And I, um, I can remember like that was a bone of contention in, in my life with Drake. For, like he's like, Betsy, why are you in such a hurry? Like I was always, I'd get out of the car and I'd be racing and he, to get to whatever store we were going to and Drake would be way far. Like it was one of the main, he's like, Betsy, why don't you want to walk with me? I'm like, well, we got to go. And he's like, why do we have to go? Why do we have to be moving so fast? And I never had a good answer for it. And, and as his health declined, like it's one of the biggest gifts that he gave me um, during uh, helping him walk through the um, the awfulness that is ALS is I had to slow down because I had to walk. He had to walk slowly. And it was the first time where I was like, so I learned how to saunter and I've never sauntered ever in my life. And so now I'm very aware of how fast everything is moving. And so I wonder in watching those shows, if most people are going to get super and myself included, even though I have learned how to slow down significantly compared to what I used to be. Um, I wonder if the pace is going to be interesting or hard for people, right? Because he was, I think that just listening to him in the short clips that are in the podcast, he was the master of the pause. And waiting to, you know, like, and that just makes me irritable, <laughs> you know, that like, what are you saying? Come on. What are you saying? What are you, you know, in that, that sil allowing for silence and space. Um, there's a, there's a quote of uh, one of the, the girl that was, or, or the woman that was interviewed pretty heavily in the first episode. She has a definition of empathy. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to get it exactly right. I wrote it down, but it said empathy is making space between the things that connect us some it's not exactly right but and i think that's what 
that's what grace is a little bit, right? Like it's empathy, but, but that's, I think empathy and grace are so closely connected conceptually, at least in my brain they are. And so making that space, but space requires quiet and quiet requires still and patience, which our society, like if it's not a 30 second clip, we're moving on. Yeah, we're already too long in this whole thing. I know. <laughs> I know. It's funny because everybody's like, that's, you know, I've got, there are two social media people that are helping me with VLI stuff. And they're like, well, you know, that's, um, that's like a, that video is like four minutes. I think that's going to be too long. And then the last three things that I've done have been over 15 minutes. So I'm like, well. <laughs> Good for them. It'll give them something to work with. Yeah, it'll give them something to work with. But um, anyway, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. You are yes. awesome. Thanks for inviting me and let me know where you find those episodes. Yeah. All right. Have a good day. All right. Talk to you later. Peace.